And good afternoon. Ethan Allen here, your host on Likeable Science. Welcome. I'm glad you're able to join us today here on Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii this Friday afternoon. We're going to be uh, taking a, a little bit of a sidestep today, a very interesting branch of science. Uh, organization dynamics is what we're going to talk about today. And I have with me Diane Barbo. Hi. And Hi, she, Ethan. She's a consultant from Australia, as you might pick up. <laughs> <laughs> she has a Master's of Applied Science in Organization Dynamics from RMIT University in Melbourne and has worked uh, on a wide array of large scale projects and help nonprofits, uh, uh, particularly in Australia. Uh, working on, the, on this subject. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe start with j just a quick, what, what, what is organi organization dynamics? Well, well, Ethan, it's a few years since I studied this, but at the time, uh, three years part-time master's degree, uh, and there were a number of similar degrees in Australia and some here in America, and they're trying to come to grips with how organizations could be more flexible and adaptive. You know, we'd had IBM, with issues, um, they'd had to reinvent themselves. And so I used to work on big um, inf information technology projects. And I ended up being a middle person between the technical people and the, um, and the user community. And I really liked it, but I had no idea why what I was doing worked. <laughs> so I found a course that might be able to teach me some techniques. So if I got in a hole, I could actually do things a bit more professionally. So we, over a three-year part-time, um, we looked at lots of different models of, way, of looking at the way groups work, small groups, medium-sized groups, large groups, um, large organisations, and I was in one large organisation with 35,000 people. It was really interesting to observe. And then with my husband, uh, who's a, a South Asianist, we've done some research in India and Pakistan, and we've looked at how states operate. So taking a, a micro to macro view, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, little bit more detail later, um, just looking at how these principles from the low level could be taken up to a much higher level. So all sorts of levels. So we looked at things like just the, the study of the human side of any kind of collective brought together to achieve some set of tasks. So we looked at um, and as I said, that could be a project or it could be a small or large organisation, private, governmental, not-for-profit, just a whole range. So the human side, um, we looked at group dynamics and, and there was a lot of research came out in Britain about how people that had come back from the war had issues um, and how they could be brought back into society and, and they were observed self-organising, leadership emerging. So there's a lot of research material came out of Britain. Um, we looked at models of leadership, so t typical sort of hierarchical, down mm -hmm. to flatter sort of structures and distributed leadership, network leadership, lots of different leadership models. Mm -hmm. um, we also did just general systems approaches, so organic systems, general systems theory, so um, you know, basic open and closed systems, all mm -hmm. that sort of analysis, which was really interesting. One of my favourites was having a brief look at chaos theory, and I'm not mm -hmm. a mathematician, mm -hmm. but or a physicist or anything like that. But I just loved it, and mm -hmm. for some reason, and complex adaptive systems sure. really appealed to me. Um, the whole idea of the macro and the micro view mm -hmm. being reflected through fractals and self-similarity, mm -hmm. all of that. I just loved all of that. And I still use that mm -hmm. in my daily practice when I think about my own life. So that was a good mm -hmm. one for me. Um, we also looked at the elements of organisations. So how do people think about strategy, purpose, values, what the culture of an organisation was going to be. And, um, you know, and looked at structures and why structures fail and how mm -hmm. people hang on to those structures no matter what, when they shouldn't be. And we also did a little bit on futurism, uh, which I thought was fantastic. Um, just open up your mind to a whole different idea of uh, looking, at all, looking at the broad environment, looking at um, all the data available, all the information you can, and then um, not using a crystal ball and saying, this is going to happen, but saying, here are the possibilities of what could happen. Yeah, fascinating. I'm, I'm in the midst of reading uh, Joe Diamond's Collapse. And <laughs> it, it really has the same kind of thing. It takes this rather big view, yeah. tries to look at all the different factors yes. that have influenced cultures, and, yes. and says, 
which which of these factors is most important where how have they yes. played out in the past and yes. then we can look forward a little bit and see how yes. how what it says about the our potential here yes you were talking about <laughs> australia and right. saying something about water and the water shortages right. and yet um we heard the other day that there's somebody discussing whether we should export water to somewhere in asia that doesn't have enough water <laughs> But this is, a climate, this is a climate with drought. What's right. going on here? Yeah, so it's interesting, isn't it? The different perspectives you get on all of this. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it, it's very funny because uh, people have been organizing in the groups ever since probably our various, even before our very early ancestors, right? Animals organize, non-human animals organize well. Uh, predators organize to hunt prey. Prey organized to defend mm -hmm. themselves against predators. Yes. Schools of fish are a very classic yes, defensive organization yes. uh, to make it very hard for predators to select out a single uh, fish to go after. Uh, likewise, of course, predators will set up elaborate mm -hmm. multi pronged attacks on, on groups of prey to, to do this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and people have been organizing, obviously. But the study of how people organize, I think, is probably relatively new. Uh, yeah, this is this is 15 years ago. Right. But it's interesting because uh, things get rediscovered in right. a different format or by some, you know, there's a different need occurs, sure. and so people look at things differently. Mm -hmm. You know, with leadership, we've had things like um, uh, uh, what do you call the? We've had vocal intelligence. We've had emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, focusing on the individual more mm -hmm. and. Um, how that person can be the best person they can be so that they can then look after their organization better. So there have been all sorts of different ways of looking at this, but it's just different language to the same sorts of things that I think have been discussed for probably half a century. Sure, sure. Mm. Uh, and it's, it, it's always been important for groups of people to get their jobs done in, in a reasonably efficient and effective yes. fashion. Yes. And Perhaps we're facing new challenges today because yes. of rapidly changing technologies. Yes. The, the very nature of sort of what we do, more and more, I think, asks people to work in groups and work very flexibly in groups. Work absolutely. Sometimes the one group, sometimes yeah. another group, with bigger groups with smaller groups. Whereas maybe in the past yeah. we worked more in in a one set in, group. In silos. Yeah. Or in even silos. In silos yeah, or in, in a small. Yes. Yeah. And hierarchies. We know hierarchies still exist. Right. Um, but. Now, there's just so much data pouring into organizations from everywhere. So if we come back to the environmental issues, so you've got what's happening inside the organization, the internal di um, dynamics or environment, but you've also got the external environment. And in this age of just overload of data mm -hmm. and changing technology, you know, people talk about the fourth revolution. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, it's a huge um, uh, revolution in data. and. Fleggy mentioned flexibility. Flexibility and adaptability are the keys. And so what people are focusing on now is how do you actually um, get your organization to be flexible? So, you know, an old hierarchy mm -hmm. um, where everything gets decided at the top mm -hmm. is a very slow, tedious process. Um, and and my, it's as a personal opinion, I think it's it diminishes the effort of the people on the way up. People can feel disempowered mm -hmm. on the on the way up through that process. I've got a story I can tell you about that in a minute. Uh, on the, the sort of flip side, though, is you look at a country like China, which has very much a top-down yeah. hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And when China is going in the future to be faced, for instance, with issues of coastal inundation, mm -hmm. they're going to be, they're a country where they can just turn to 20 million of their people and say, next week, you're moving 20 miles inland, yes. and 20 million yes. people will move next week. Yes. We couldn't in this country, in the US, we couldn't do that. I mean, no. that would be tied up no, in lawsuits no, no. for decades. No, nor, nor Australia. <laughs> right. The, the right. lawyers would make so, a fortune. <laughs> so, so, so there's some, uh, a, a strong central leadership in that sense. It gives yes. some flexibility to a big state. Yeah, right. that's right. So. Um, one of the stories that I tell is of working in one of the big um, professional services organisations, you know, big international law, law and accounting firms. Well, I, I did a short contract in one of these places, mm -hmm. and I was there to support some of the staff in developing themselves and their training ability. And I, it was funny, they were running an auditors course. I ended up running a section of the course, and I had no idea about accounting and auditing. <laughs> so you just pull together all the reserves that you're... Mm -hmm teaching other people and just do it, it was, it was fun. But people were, to an extent, disempowered because 
they'd write a report, a um, junior manager, and it would go up through layers and layers and layers of managers mm -hmm. um, to be approved. So this could take quite a while, mm -hmm. it was disempowering for the person. And now we would call that bullying in our workplaces mm. because people would come in with expertise. They'd expect their expertise to be acknowledged. Everybody wants a voice. They're mm -hmm. all on Twitter and Facebook and whatever else. Um, and they all want to be noticed and they all want their voice to be heard and they want to be understood. So their identity is now bound up in who they are. And I remember when I first went to work, people would say to me, just leave your personality and your personal stuff at the door and come in and be this other person. I mean, well, that doesn't work for right. me, ever. <laughs> but that was the way it was, well, that's just gone. And now people do share things about each other. Mm -hmm. um, and interesting, I, could, I might come, come to this report a bit later mm -hmm. on. There's a fantastic report that I want to refer to. Uh, so I think that the world has changed a huge amount and people, as you say, are looking for answers to how they can be flexible and adaptable. Right. So many people now have either multiple jobs or their, their job has forced them to be sort of different people at different times, to do more more kinds mm -hmm. of different things. You're not just sitting here with, with adding up columns and numbers or whatever, doing mm -hmm. one repetitive task, that, that kind of job yes. is largely gone or yeah, at least outsourced if, if not taken over mm. by a machine somewhere and instead you're having to make decisions and judgment calls mm. and yes in the face of this you know flood of data yeah. coming in uh, at you uh, surges of it coming from different directions yes. at different times yes. yeah, and having to figure out when when to switch directions when to persevere yeah. on your course yeah I know you and I have talked um, before about starting something. Mm -hmm. We were talking about starting a project and you asked me what the key elements were. Mm -hmm. And so some of the issues go right back to the beginning of the organisation and so people get in consultants to help them rethink their whole organisation. So they talk about it in strategic terms. Um, my, after finishing this uh, course, I came out of that thinking the key thing is what's the primary purpose of this piece of work mm -hmm. or this organisation or this community? What's the primary purpose? And secondly, what are the values associated with that? Why, why do you, what good can this piece of work do? Is there some value for society or is it simply about making money? Mm -hmm. um, if it is, then define even what that means in real terms. And all of that before people put structure together. People, I, I know, people used to just want to put a structure in place. Oh, we've got to put the team together. Okay, well, we can put a team together, but um, what is it that you want to achieve and why are we achieving this and what does it look like and how many of these widgets are we going to make? And, you know, just talking about it, but importantly, what the value system will be of the organisation. Yeah, uh, and the values, I think, are very critical. What, what is it that drives your organization? What, what sort of is the, the heart or the soul of the organization? Yeah. What do they exist, as you say, to bring, to contribute to the world? Yes. Presumably, it is something uh, besides money. And I think we're going to get to that uh, after a, a short break here. Absolutely. And I hope you'll stay, stick with us and join us uh, when we come back here. Uh, think Tech Hawaii, Diane Barbola, and I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science. We'll be right back. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet, please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Aloha. My name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association. And our show is all about educating board members and owners about their responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. You can watch me live on Thursdays 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. 
And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think, in the think Tech studios is Diane Barbelay. She is a consultant from Australia on organization dynamics and has uh, had vast experience in a number of different groups. And we were just talking before about some of the, the uh, issues of the underlying values and, and sort of purpose and, and larger contributions to society that, that sort of help drive organizations. Yes. So um, I want to just give an example. Um, I know politics is interesting in this country. I've been <laughs> riveted by what's going on in your, in your election process. I did pick up a book by David Plouffe, who ran Obama's first campaign, President Obama's first campaign. I read him a book for a dollar called Dare to Win. Uh -huh. And it was really interesting um, that when they were setting up the team, they knew what, they, what the purpose was. but. One of the things that um, President Obama insisted on, from what Plouffe says, is the values that they were going to work by. Mm -hmm. Were they going to be critical of other people? How they were going to handle criticism? All the values about the organisation stuck in my mind. I thought, well, that's really fantastic to find that somebody's actually practising that. Um, and I know that lots of organizations are working like that now, saying what is the value, instead of just assuming. And then once you've got that value right, um, and going through all the other steps, pulling the team together, ensuring everybody understands how that value fits into the overall mission. That's it. Communicating yeah. all of that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I'm, I'm working uh, on a project right now. It's a, a National Science Foundation funded uh, EPSCOR project at the uh -huh. University of Hawaii. And I was very surprised the leadership there pulled together a, a very clear set of five values that, are, that have to permeate everything they do. They, they, and they keep coming back to them and referring to them again and again and again. Mm -hmm. I want to be sure that everyone on the team mm -hmm. understands yeah. these values that are driving us. So it's, yeah. And this sort of gets us to, to, I know, what the thing you wanted to mention a little bit about this project Aristotle, right? Oh, yeah, the Google project. Right. Yeah. Um, I was alerted to the report in the New York Times magazine, mm -hmm. February 25 okay. this year. Uh, I mean, it's just a, a report on the report right. from the project, but it's really interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, it do, talks about... Do, so, do, you, do you need to maybe say a little background or...? or? Um, yeah, they were trying to figure out what the perfect team was. Right, in Google, right? Yeah, Google. <laughs> so they've got their you know, distributed sort of leadership and they've got their network leadership happening. How can they be flexible? How can they be quicker, right. more productive, Fire some teams more better creative? Because right. with the flexibility right. comes more creativity. So they're trying to find out what the what the ideal team was. Right. Um, well, you know, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> and it took a lot of time. Right. Um, but interestingly, they came to the things that we were taught 15 years before <laughs> this report came out. It was about um, people acting more collaboratively. Mm -hmm. Um, talking about data-saturated age, but there's some wonderful quotes, and I'll talk directly to it. Profitability increases when workers are persuaded to collaborate more. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. If a company wants to outstrip its competitors, it needs to influence not only how people work, but also how they work together, mm -hmm. which comes back to even small teams within an organisation deciding how they want to work. Right. It talks about... Um, really what they found was that if people sat down and said, well, look, I really like to just stick to the agenda every mm -hmm. time. Can we just stick to the agenda? I don't want to talk about what I did at the weekend. Mm -hmm. When you and I, before we came mm -hmm. in, I said, so, are we sticking to the agenda? <laughs> and you said, I'm flexible. I said, that's good. <laughs> um, but that's not everybody's cup of tea. Mm -hmm. And I can remember being in the IT world and having a big project group of about 20 people and the, I, the programmers hated it if I went off the agenda. Mm -hmm. They just, they wanted step one, step two. Well, sure, computer but, programmers, yeah, computers run, run on programs that must yeah. run on the agenda. I was one, I was one of them right. once, and there's no surprise I'm right. not anymore. Um, so it was very interesting, um, and I had to manage that and assure people that we would do everything on the agenda, but we might actually move them around a bit. And as they got more comfortable with that, and we all understood each other and got to know each other a bit better, it was a very productive team. That's, and that, so that's what that, they're saying. They there. talk about the establishment of a trusting environment. Absolutely, uh, that's uh, exactly what they feel said. Psychologically safe. Yeah. You know. And it said once you've got these teams understanding that, well, psychologically psych psychological safety is the big takeaway right. here for me. Yeah. 
huge thing. Um, and then understanding and influencing group norms. So mm -hmm. they've set their norms, how they're going to behave, right. um, when they're going to meet, simple things about how they're going to treat each other, what sort of respect levels there are right. going to be, who's going to, everybody's going to speak us an equal amount, right. or no, 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 you're going to take turns, this week it's his turn, next week right. it's her turn. Um, so understanding and influencing group norms were the key to improving Google's teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I thought that was really, really interesting as well and sort of fits in. And then, of course, here we are, page eight, psychological safety. Yeah. is a sense of confidence that the team will not embarrass, reject or punish someone for speaking up, right. which is the anti-bullying right. thing, isn't it? Exactly, it's, exactly. Yeah. And it's, again, it makes perfect sense. You've got to in order to be creative, you've got to be able to express yourself freely. Yeah. And if you're worried that things you say will come back to haunt you or be used yes. against you later yes. or will appear in a report criticizing you or mm -hmm. will get people laughing at you or whatever, you won't mm -hmm. say them. Mm -hmm. you, you, won't, you won't open up and you won't be free. You won't be creative. No, you know? that's, that's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. And it, uh, it, um, they're talking about team climate characterized by interpersonal trust a mutual respect in which people are comfortable being themselves, which right. is exactly what you said. Mm. So people these days come in with a, you know, pretty good idea of their own identity. Right. And, and they want to maintain it. Right. And you've got to then get comfortable with this idea that you and I may have very different ideas, we may be very different people, we may have different political views or whatever, mm. and that's all fine. We can still yeah. have a, 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 a calm and rational discussion about this project yeah. that we're on and the, the common goals we share and how we're going to get yeah. there. Even yeah. if our viewpoints, yeah. our contexts, our backgrounds all differ radically, indeed, mm. those differences, I think, yeah. are often what bring real strength to teams, right? Yeah, so it comes back to, back to basic general systems theory of mm -hmm. an open, environment or a closed environment. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about a clock that just tick, tick, tick until right. it wears out. Entropy sets in, entropy. Um, it's about an open, open society, an open conversation. So it's open within a team. Um, it's listening to influences from the environment mm -hmm. um, and not blocking them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's respecting everybody's abilities, mm -hmm. which I think is important. Now look, I know some of that's idealistic mm -hmm. um, but I guess where that's working it's working extremely well and of course I've walked, worked in the not profit for profit um, industry and I've chaired a couple of boards and that's very hard work when right. people come from different parts of the com of the community they come with different educational backgrounds different understandings of the world and the environment right. um, but you have to find some way of getting them all to work you have to find something that you can all aim at so it, it, it reminds me actually of uh, Oliver Sacks' book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Yes. And this, his story of this gentleman he runs into in a mental institution, the guy is, uh, has very severe psychological problems and, and is not very functional. But what he discovers, what Sachs discovers, is that this guy knows a tremendous amount about music. And he starts questioning about how, yeah. how does he know about music. And it turns out his father was a musician, and his father read him an entire encyclopedia mm -hmm. as a child yes. uh, about music. And yes. this guy knew everything in this encyclopedia. He had, he had basically he had just memorized this. And so he had this vast encyclopedia knowledge of music. And so Sachs puts him in touch with the local theater group. And his life becomes much enriched by this because he can help advise this group on staging any opera because he knows all the operas, he knows the music <laughs> in them, he knows what the stage oh, thing is supposed to look great. like. He just knows yeah. all this stuff about them and, and was able then to sort of get uninstitutionalized and, and really integrated yeah. into the society yes. much better because yes. they could take advantage yes. of his particular strength. Yes. Uh, I think too, if we come back to leadership, um, Fabulous leaders are sort of visionary people, and right. you know, everybody quotes Elon Musk mm -hmm. as having being one of those visionary people. Um, they're pretty rare, I yeah. think. Um, so most people have to learn how to be good leaders, mm -hmm. I think. Um, you can come out of university with a master's degree and something, but uh, m my friend Dr. Louise Marler in Australia, who's dealing with vocal intelligence, she finds people in very senior roles who struggle with public speaking, mm -hmm. dealing with staff. Oh, I've got to give a report to 300 staff. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do this. Um, so taking them right back to basics of 
their voices, their breathing, mm. their posture, um, finding out who, what the best is that they can be and opening them up, freeing them up yeah. and being brave enough to let things go. Right, right. Having enough confidence to say, oh, he knows what he's doing, right. we can let him get on with it and make the decision. Yeah. But that's, that's a long process. But there are an increasing number of people understand they have to do that. Right, right. It is more and more of us are called on to, to at least translate and take that kind of role. Yes, and, yes. You know, there, there are lots of sort of organizations and processes around that actually help do that. Mm. Everything from simple things yeah. like being a member of a Toastmasters group. So yes. there's a re really great practice of That's that. the same and sort of thing. For yeah, at least a minute or two, suddenly yeah. like you're in charge. And yes. You have to so um, <coughs> in the organizations like those in Silicon Valley, just the resilience to changes in the market, I mean, mm. they have to be able to jump so quickly. Right. And so, you know, you've got to have that distributed or network kind of leadership to be able to respond really instantly to things that are changing. Yeah. Um, but it, robots are on the way. I have a grandson who wants to be CEO of his own robotics company and he mm. thinks that families and people are going to need these things in their houses mm. and that's what he wants to do. I'm thinking, how do they know about this? <laughs> <laughs> but that's their vision of the future. Mm. That's their lives. Yeah. It's, the technology is what's just going to take over. It is, it is. And the technology is going to do it, but it's, it's not ever going to eliminate the fact that people no. are going to be in organizations, right. they're going to be working together on projects. And this is why we need to keep studying this whole business, yes, right? We, we need, need to yes. understand our own mental processes, yes. as well as how when individuals get together into groups, how those groups begin to mm. impact and, and interact with each other, right? Yes, yeah. yes, that's absolutely right. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Well, Diane, this has been great. It's been <laughs> it's great fun. fun talking with you here and, and getting your insights on things. I uh, appreciate your taking the time to come and join us today right. here on Likeable Science. And thanks for having me on the show, oh. Ethan. It's been well, wonderful. Thank yeah, you. You're very welcome. And I hope you will join us next week uh, again on Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Ethan Allen signing off. <laughs>